assassin late today as he stood on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King had planned to lead another civil rights march in Memphis next Monday. We got the latest on the story now from Russ Hodge, news director of WREC-TV in Memphis. Police recovered what is believed to be the murder weapon, a Browning rifle with a scope sight. Reverend Andrew Young, King's top lieutenant, was at the hospital awaiting word and described the shooting. Well, we were at the Torch Motel and we were getting ready to go to dinner at Reverend Kyle's house, and we were waiting for Dr. King to get ready. And as, as he came out of his room on the edge of the balcony, he was shot. And we thought a firecrack had gone on. Most of us were downstairs on the lower level. And we immediately ran up and saw that he'd been pretty badly wounded and sent for the ambulance and the police and everybody. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, in color, 
This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Russ Hodge in Memphis, Tennessee, Dan Rather in New York, Bernard Kalb in Saigon, Marvin Kalb in Wellington, New Zealand, and Berkwin in Quezon, South Vietnam. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all-points bulletin for a well-dressed young white man seen running from the sea. Officers also reportedly chased and fired on a radio-equipped car containing two white men. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second-floor hotel room tonight when, according to a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. In the friend's words, the bullet exploded in his face. Police, who have been keeping a close watch over the Nobel Peace Prize winner because of Memphis' turbulent racial situation, were on the scene almost immediately. They rushed the 39-year-old Negro leader to a hospital where he died of a bullet wound in the neck. Police said they found a high-powered hunting rifle about a block from the hotel, but it was not immediately identified as the murder weapon. Mayor Henry Loeb has reinstated the dusk-to-dawn curfew he imposed on the city last week when a march led by Dr. King erupted in violence. Governor Buford Ellington has called out 4,000 National Guardsmen. The police report that the murder has touched off sporadic acts of violence in a Negro section of the city. In a nationwide television address, President Johnson expressed the nation's shock. America is shocked and saddened by the brutal slaying tonight of Dr. Martin Luther King. I ask every citizen to reject the blind violence that has struck Dr. King, who lived by nonviolence. This gives me an opportunity to say something that needs to be said. As a citizen of Houston, this man has been that common influence in all communities, in all sectors of our city, in doing the right thing, making the corporations responsible, making our educational system responsible to its citizens. And in the communities where we are trying to elevate educational status of the underprivileged, he is that influential person who is always at the forefront of all of these battles. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome to this podium, Reverend Bill A. Lawson. First, I want to thank my friend Henry Brown. That is quite an introduction especially when he is introducing a person who won't even make his product. <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Bernd Swisher for making me his guest, allowing me to come. President Rick, I have a great deal of appreciation for Rotary. It is a service organization that exists to help other people. That's what the church is for. To all of you who are present, members, visitors, this is a special day for me, largely because if Dr. King had lived until tomorrow, he would be 87 years old. You have an old 87-year-old preacher standing up here. <laughs> Those who are of some age in this room will understand what I'm about to say. If you have achieved anything, by now you know you did not achieve it because of your own skill your own abilities, your own connections, your own money. You came along a trail where somebody helped you. And if you didn't realize it when you were too young and arrogant, you certainly realize it by now. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
was a hero to many of us. I have a young man in this room of whom I'm very proud, Brother Jonathan Howard back there. I watched that brilliant young man as he recites some of Martin's speeches. And I realize that Dr. King has made this entire world a lot better, not just this nation, but this entire world. I want to thank likewise those of you who have allowed this kind of a program to be held. Rotary has a lot of reasons to have speakers, but it means something very special when you have set aside this day to remember, to honor, to memorialize the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He is the one person after whom we have a holiday named. We have a President's Day, but that's for all presidents. There is no other national holiday on our calendar that is named after, after an individual except this one man. <clears throat> what I'd like to say is that as memorable as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is, as heroic as we account him to be, all of us know somehow that he didn't get there by himself. That there were a number of other people, a number of, of other events that brought him to the place where he could give that rousing I have a dream speech. And what I'd like to do for just a few minutes is to talk about where he came from, what made him, what he was. Would you believe that it started with white segregationists? I pause. In the 1880s, the late 19th century, in the 1880s, what would have been rotary was good-willed white people who believed that the newly freed slaves needed to be given an opportunity that they had never had before, to learn, to be educated. And so there were a number of people in the South who pledged themselves to help black people to learn. Two missionary women decided to establish a school for girls in Atlanta, Georgia, where they could learn to read and write. And in 1881, they established that school. In 1882, the, there was a Baptist convention being held in Cleveland, Ohio. And these ladies, being Baptists, went to the Baptist convention in Cleveland and hoped that they could convince the Baptist convention, the national convention, to give some money to help them with this girls' school in Atlanta. They made an appeal to a church where the Bill Gates of that day was a member, John D. Rockefeller. They were sure that that church, the Erie, Erie Baptist Church, would give them some money for this school. The church did. They lifted an offering and gave them $250. Please be patient. This is leading someplace. <laughs> One of the persons who heard their appeal was Laura Spellman Rockefeller. And Laura convinced her husband to give something else beside that $250. John D., a devout Baptist. If you watched his business practices, you wouldn't say he was a Christian, but he was a devout Baptist. <laughs> but he put another thousand dollars in that offering plate. And the two ladies from Atlanta almost fainted. 
that somebody would give them that much money. If there are persons too young to know who John D. Rockefeller was, he was the founder of what was then called Standard Oil. It's been broken down into a whole lot of companies now, but the largest of those is Exxon. But he was the wealthiest man in the nation at that time. These ladies thanked him and went back to Atlanta and bought five little buildings that were Civil War military buildings and put their school in those five buildings. In 1883, Laura Spellman Rockefeller said to her husband, we need to go down to Georgia and see our school. So John D. went with her. And how proud they were of what those Baptist missionaries had done with that school. They were very proud of that school. John D. paid off his debt and said there needs to be a school for colored boys, too. Those missionaries were very happy with what John D. was doing. So they named the school after Laura, Spelman College. John D. said, if we're going to have a boys' school, we need to start on that right now. So he sent his business manager down to Atlanta to see if he could develop a school for boys. The business manager's name was Henry Morehouse. Are you beginning to see some of the pattern here? <laughs> so, so the school for boys was built and was named Morehouse. In order to build these schools, John D. said they need decent land. So in the middle of the most aristocratic white neighborhood in Atlanta, John D. bought a large portion of land. That's where Spelman and Morehouse are right now. The first graduate of Morehouse College, this boys' school, was a preacher. Is that all right, Reverend McCullough? A Baptist preacher, A.D. Williams. Are you still with me? A.D. Yeah. Williams came out of Morehouse, and he was pastor of a little church. The little church was called Ebenezer Baptist Church. And he had one daughter, Alberta. In those days, it, it was fairly common, if you were middle class to affluent, and you had a home, and there were youngsters going to school near you, they didn't have dormitories in those days, then middle class to affluent black people would let college kids stay in their home. So he allowed A.D. Williams, Reverend A.D. Williams allowed college students to stay in his home. One of those college students was named Michael King. Michael King stayed in the home where Alberta was living. So obviously Reverend Williams wanted to make absolutely sure that he kept his distance from the daughter. She liked him, and he liked her. And ultimately, young Michael King, who was called to ministry, by the way, fell in love and got married. Young Michael, after he got married, became the associate pastor of, the, of, of, of Ebenezer Baptist Church. He was the shadow of Reverend Williams. Everywhere Reverend Williams went, so Michael King went. Reverend Williams died, and the church called Michael to be pastor of that church. He was a good pastor. Those were affluent years in the nation. Those were the years, the 1920s, Harlem Renaissance, big stuff going on. And in the South, black people began to make good money. And the Ebenezer Baptist Church grew under the leadership of Michael King. And ultimately, became so wealthy that they could send 
Reverend King on vacation wherever he wanted to go. He wanted to go to Europe. That's where all the white people had come from. And he wanted to go to Europe. Went to England, went to Spain, went to France, went to Germany. He and his one son, Michael Jr. And while they were there, they happened to hear about the place where Martin Luther had come from. There he had nailed 95 theses to a place in Wittenberg. Michael King was so moved by this, by the nature of the scholarship of this man, and by the fact that he would go against the Roman Catholic Church to preach justice by faith. He was so moved until he changed his name from Michael King to Martin King. He had his little boy with him, changed his name too. Are you still with me? So now we had a Martin Luther King Sr. and a Martin Luther King Jr. He came back brought his son, and the nation was plunged into depression. But in those days, it was the nature of the black church. It never was very much the nature of the white church, but it was the nature of the black church to get involved in social justice, to feed people, to clothe people, to help people. The church was the center of the black community. Some of you are old enough to remember that it was almost that way here at one time. And so Martin Luther King Sr. taught his people at Ebenezer Baptist Church that that was how it was supposed to be. The church was the center of the community. Martin Luther King Jr., like his father, went to Morehouse College. When he finished Morehouse College, he went to Boston University's Crozer Theological Seminary. And from there, he learned from people who were uh, <coughs> people who were leaders in social justice, which was a kind of a radical form of the Christian church. But Martin Luther King Jr. learned that kind of theology. Got a PhD and could have gone into being a college professor. But he, like his father, had been called to ministry. And so he went instead into a pulpit. He was called to a church, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. There is a line going here, and if you get bored, I won't feel bad if we get up and leave. <laughs> but we're talking about somebody who needs to be remembered. This is not just another hero. This is somebody who helped to change the nature of our nation. He, with one movement in the 20th century, prophesied the nature of the 21st century. We wouldn't be as diverse as we are in this room had it not been for his feeling about what a nation needed to be. So he accepted the call to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, and that could have been where he stayed. Something that seems to be totally unrelated. The NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, when we sang the song, lift every voice and sing, that was a song that was called our Negro National Anthem. That came out of the, that came out of the NAACP. The NAACP, uh, the NAACP in Montgomery, Alabama, decided that they were tired of segregated buses in Montgomery. So they were going to have a sit-in Students had begun sit-ins and lunch counters and things of that sort. They were going to have a sit-in in Montgomery. And they sent a woman named Rosa Parks to sit in an illegal place 
before whites were supposed to sit. And she went to sit in that illegal place, and as you might expect, she was arrested, thrown in jail. Has nothing to do with Martin Luther King being called to the Reverend Baptist Church in, in, in Montgomery, Alabama. If you're listening to me, you're hearing the way God orchestrates history. Yes. Stuff doesn't happen by accident. Stuff doesn't happen by coincidence. Somehow God brings things together. They decided that they were going to have to get this woman out of jail. And so there was created something called the Montgomery Improvement Association. But they, have a, but they had to have a place to meet. Where would they meet? The black church always was the center of the community. And there was a black church not too far away from where they were starting that buff city. Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. His pastor was a young man named Martin Luther King Jr. So they asked him if it would, if it would be all right for them to meet him in that church. Of course he said yes. He had grown up almost with, with, with the social gospel. Now, he had his own kind of theology. His theology had been gotten at least in part from the teachers of the social gospel and partly from an Indian leader named Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi believed in protest, but he believed in nonviolent protest. And Martin Luther King had learned about nonviolent protest. So he said to the leaders of the NAACP, I believe that we ought to protest against the Montgomery Bus Company, but we must protest nonviolently. So the notion of nonviolent protest came out of that Montgomery Improvement Association. It became so big that he couldn't stay at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, and he asked his father, can I come back and be with you? So Martin Luther King Jr. went back to, went, went back to Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta to be the associate pastor of that church. He never again pastored. But while he was there, things began to happen. And one of the worst things that began to happen was protest in Birmingham, Alabama. That's a long story, and I won't take the time to tell that long story. But the worst part of that story was that somebody from the Ku Klux Klan came by a church in Birmingham, threw a bomb in a window, and killed three little girls. And people were then ready uh, to rise up in, in, in angry protest. Martin Luther King Jr. was called over to that church, and he began to teach nonviolent protest. So the long story that we are telling here is that if you begin to tie together John D. Rockefeller and Laura Spellman Rockefeller, A.D. Williams and, 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 and Michael King, who fell in love with his daughter, and gave birth to Martin Luther King Jr., you begin to see that there is a chain that happens here. Ultimately, there was a movement called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That was, that was something born out of Atlanta. The most important thing, I think, that we can say is that there is an orchestration, there is a time together of all of these things. Something happened in 1962 that certainly would have made no sense at all. ANA or AT&T, <coughs> two or three other corporations began to create a space program. And out of, and out of that space program, they fired into the sky something called Telstar. Telstar would make it possible to, to televise things on the ground. It was decided that there needed to be told to, to the entire nation what the problems of black people were. And 
Martin Luther King was one of many speakers. That was a whole lot longer program than this is. But he was one of many speakers at a march on Washington in August 1963. And when that speech was given, for the first time, something said by one human being could be televised to the entire world. Because now you had tail star in the skies. He, did, he, he gave that speech. Very shortly after that, John Kennedy, who was the president, was killed. And when he was killed, he was replaced by a white southerner, Lyndon B. Johnson. John B. Kennedy had no power with Congress. He was like Barack Obama. LBJ, on the other hand, virtually controlled Congress. Now he was the president, and Kennedy was dead. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the NAACP and the Urban League and a number of other institutions were trying to get a civil rights bill through Congress. It was failing consistently, no way, until Lyndon B. Johnson came in the White House. Now you had a man who had power with Congress. So what Kennedy couldn't do in 1963, Johnson did do in 1964. We got a civil rights bill because Lyndon B. Johnson was there. Martin wasn't satisfied with just a civil rights bill. He wanted a voting rights bill. So he pushed Lyndon, and Lyndon hated him for that. But nonetheless, Lyndon used that hammer-like power in Congress to get a voting rights bill in 1965. In 1968, Martin went to Memphis, and he was going to, he was going to be an advocate for garbage workers. Here's a young man who grew up in an affluent background, the grandson of a powerful, well-paid preacher, the son of a powerful, well-paid preacher, living in a neighborhood where he never, ever had to ride a bus. And he began his ministry as an advocate for people who did have to ride <coughs> buses. And when he went to Memphis, he went there to be an advocate for garbage workers. He never even had to carry the trash out of his own house. And yet, that was what made him work. So we certainly ought to remember and respect Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. But we must also realize he didn't get there by himself. He was made by a whole lot of people and events that brought him to the place where he was. I'd like to at least urge that we feel in very much the same way that we need to make some changes in our town. I'm very proud of Rotary. I came over here with, 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 a, with a Rotarian who has been president of this chapter. And it means a lot to me to know that I can see blacks, browns, orientals, along with the whites who are here. Changes have been made. I'll be trying to make one more change in this town. Martin is dead. I'm 87. I'm still alive. But I'm a very old man. I'm having to have geriatric medicine done now. And I just discovered about a month ago that Houston, with its fantastic medical center, does not have a geriatric hospital. <clears throat> there are a number of cities that have geriatric hospitals, but the size of this population, and with right now the largest population growing, being old people, we have a larger number of elderly than we have ever had before. So the last push that I will make in Houston, Texas, is to try to get our medical center 
to have a geriatric hospital. I won't live to see it, but I hope that I can expect Rotary International to help me. I didn't get here by myself, you didn't get here by yourself, but every one of us ought to do something that can make a difference in our community. Paul Harris would be glad about that. In the late 1930s, perhaps, we dredged out a canal from Galveston to Houston that became Buffalo Bio. And we were very much uh, proud that now we were able to bring ocean liners uh, with oil and gas all the way up to Houston. That made Houston the oil and gas capital of the world. We were glad that Houston, wanting to have a, a major league baseball team, went to the uh, went, went, went to the National League and asked about the possibility of having a baseball team here. Well, we were told they would be willing to come here except that the climate of Houston was too bad. And Houston agreed to build a stadium that had a roof over it and that could be air conditioned. Nothing like that had ever been done before. So we could get Major League Baseball in Houston. Houston became the place where it was possible for, uh, for us to explore space. And we were going to build a space center and make it possible to send some kind of vehicles from Houston to do that. Houston was becoming big stuff. All around, we were being made uh, a top city. <clears throat> the last thing we needed was to have a Birmingham to occur here. And so it was agreed that the business leaders of the white community and the business and civic leaders of the black community would get together behind closed doors and discuss stopping segregation in Houston's downtown without anybody knowing about it. We met in the Rice Hotel, and, uh, and as we met, it was agreed that one day uh, Houston's media would be completely silent while downtown institutions and businesses would desegregate, take down the white and colored signs off the metro buses, stop all the, the white and colored drinking fountains, make it possible for people to go into the department stores, and we'll do all that on one day. And there were black women who liked to shop at Foley's, who would just go into Foley's one day. And, uh, and the salesperson who met them would say, would you like to try on some shoes? That had never been said before. People would be able to get on the bus, and when they got on the bus, the sign that said white and colored was gone. We didn't understand what had happened. But the Houston Post didn't report it. The Houston Chronicle didn't report it. It was not reported on any, on, on any of the television stations. And so we got fussed at by Time Magazine and Life Magazine because we had done something in, they hadn't been told. That's basically how it was done. It was done behind closed doors by the leaders of the white community and the leaders of the, of, of, of the, of, of the black community, uh, arguing until they could finally come to a way of doing it. And that one day it was done, and we didn't have a Birmingham. That's, that's the fair story of it.